reality exist or not? Uh, or, or does the wave function represent reality? Uh, I guess that's uh, part of the first question. Uh, locality. Um, that, that's a big question and, and that is sort of interlinked with reality or not through Bell's theorem. Uh, um, Bell's theorem has something to say that the combination of these two uh, 
has something um, intrinsic in quantum theory that they go together. Another question is, what is the difference between classical physics and quantum physics? What is what phenomena that we that we see in quantum physics is actually quantum, or is merely um, uh, something that um, can also occur in classical theory? And um, the basic question is, why is quantum mechanics the way it is and not some other theory? So now we're thinking more metaphysics, meta theories. Um, can we think of more generalized theories by which quantum mechanics um, is just one um, particular instance? Um, are there any principles, physical principles, that constrain ourselves to only have quantum theory? Or could we have some other possible other theory? So let's just uh, remind ourselves what quantum theory, I mean, the, 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 the key points of quantum theory. <clears throat> so we have that um, the state of the system is represented by a, a, a complex vector, well, a vector in the complex Hilbert space, and that encodes a maximal state of knowledge. So this is um, all that we can ever know a priori to, to a measurement about the state. Um, and then um, the actual physical properties that we measure, that we actually extract when we actually observe a system, are represented by Hermitian operators. But the key thing which, which characterizes quantum theory apart from a classical theory is that when we make a measurement, the theory only can predict the probability of a certain outcome coming. There is no lower level description by which um, the system has a definite value or definite outcome for a measurement. Um, the, the quantum theory does not give you that certainty, uh, even at, a, at an underlying level. Uh, another thing in, in, uh, that differs from classical theory is that measurement is an active process. It's not merely a passive revelation of a pre-existing um, value, but it actually modifies the state. And so the question is whether that modification is a real physical modification or is it actually just a modification of our knowledge, such as um, a ba like a Bayesian uh, update rule if you uh, learn something um, that, that just changes your priors. Now, something which <coughs> is also very intrinsic to quantum theory, which is com com uh, very different from classical theory, is that there is an intrinsic uncertainty uh, in that uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty tells us that there are, um, due to the fact that there are observables up here which do not commute, at least to the fact that there are states, or well, all states um, have certain properties which are undefined uh, or un uh, are not well defined or not definite. So we cannot have the simultaneous definite. Uh, properties of, of all observables um, for, for a state. And then obviously um, we've got uh, classic phenomena, well not classic phenomena, but quantum, classical uh, quantum phenomena which everyone knows, yeah, entanglement, non-locality. So just to, just to reiterate what, what the differences between quantum and classical theories are, in that, um, in a classical theory, you know, think of Newtonian mechanics. Particles, um, they all have position and momenta, and they have actual position and momenta. Um, and, and the state of the system can, can be, you know, it can be, in principle, uh, said to be in you know, one of these definite states. Um, we can think of uh, statistical mechanics, or you know, thermodynamics, or whatever, as being a, an ignorance of knowledge of what the actual physical state is, but at the very underlying level, there are actual states that physical systems are in. And that measurement can be, in principle, non-invasive or non-disturbing. So um, measurement just simply reveals a pre-existing state of reality. Now, quantum theory is, is uh, very different in that um, we we don't assume that there is an underlying definite state of things. Um, in particular, um, 
I, so, so for instance, we allow superposition of states. So if we have two allowed states, then the, uh, the superposition of those two is another state, and that superposition may not correspond to some macro-realistic state of the system. So think of Schrodinger's cat. You have a dead cat, we have a live cat. Those are perfectly uh, acceptable states of reality for a cat, but quantum mechanics would say that an allowed state, allowed physical state, would be the superposition of dead and alive. So this caused, well, this is yeah, the, the example that Schrodinger gave, that you know, this was not an acceptable state of affairs, because we never observe half, well, cats which are in the superposition of dead or alive. Um, and this sort of falls on to the, set, to the second point, in that in classical theory, if we have two different states, so two, two states which are distinct, so for instance the particle over here and the particle over here, then those two physical states are distinct, sorry, are different, yeah, they're, they're different and they're distinct. So when we make our classical measurement and reveal the pre-existing reality, we can unambiguously identify whether a state is over here or over here. But in quantum theory, we have the, the situation where distinct, where distinct states, um, so uh, for instance, let's say we have a spin half particle, we have a, uh, a, a sigma z plus, plus one sigma z eigenstate and a plus one uh, sigma x eigenstate, these are different states, and they're distinct. Well, sorry, they're different, but they're not orthogonal. So um, there is no measurement that can unambiguously always tell you which one is which. Whereas in classical theory, those two different states, um, they are orthogonal. Right? There, are, there, there are no non-orthogonal different states in classical physics, at least at the underlying uh, base reality. Uh, and then, um, as, as, as we say, measurement is intrinsically disturbing. It's an active process between uh, a system and whatever does the measurement, whether we, we think of it as an instrument or an observer or whatever. Um, it is always the interaction of, of two systems which lead to measurement. And in, in that interaction, we have disturbance. All right, so with this background, and the differences between classical physics and quantum physics, we, we want to uh, think about you know how we're going to approach the subject. Well, uh, I just nicked this off the Perrins Institute. <laughs> uh, so this is what they say about foundations. So <clears throat> one is a purely sort of um, sort of uh, pragmatic or practical aspect of foundations. Is let's look at some novel effects on quantum theory. Um, you know, maybe there's some interesting things happening that, that you know, we could use. So examples of that would be you know, things like um, you know, teleportation or, or, or uh, the no cloning theorem or something like that. Um, these, are, these are quite interesting effects that, that have found greater, greater wider applicability. So it's fun to, to, to look for those kind of um, things. Uh, the, then the second approach would be, um, and strand would be, say, to investigate conceptual issues in quantum theory or interpretations, you know, um, you can argue till the cows come home about whether it's, you know, we've got one world or many worlds. Um, and then I guess this is the, the, the strand which is most applicable to this, um, to this conference, and that's you know, developing a deeper understanding of the structure of the theory. Maybe look at different approaches to understanding how the various phenomena in, in quantum theory arise through its, uh, say, mathematical uh, and also there's a program for trying to reconstruct the theory from a set of basic axioms. So um, there are a lot of, well not a lot of, but yeah, quite a few papers which say you know, quantum theory derived from a few reasonable assumptions, uh, whereas you know, where uh, the definition of reasonable is rather flexible. And also, I guess, you know, ultimately we need to go beyond quantum theory because we know quantum theory, even though it is the most successful physical theory that we have, we know it is not the final word because there's a big glaring hole in our 
physical theory in that there's general relativity on one side which explains the large scale structure of the universe very well. And we've got quantum theory which explains the, the, the micro scale very well. And we know that both very, very accurate in their own domains. And, and, they're all, and they're correct to some degree. The question is, how do they meet in the middle? How, how, how do we extend it um, so that we have a unified theory which encompasses both gravitation and quantum theory? <clears throat> so actually, foundations and the study of, of, of um, the conceptual uh, framework of quantum theory is very important in trying to have to reconcile uh, these two paradigms of physical theory. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm just going to very quickly through the question of interpretations. Um, uh, basically, you know, there are different ways of trying to interpret quantum theory. We're not going to go through it in any detail here, but just to mention that you know, there's the Copenhagen interpretation, whatever that actually means. Um, and if you read what Bohr has to, to write about um, the subject, um, he's uh, not, not particularly clear as, as, to, as to what the actual interpretation is. Um, yeah, there's obviously the many worlds or, you know, relate to that many minds interpretation where it's the antithesis of the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, there's the non, no interpretation interpretation, just <laughs> set up and calculate, which Feynman famously uh, was, was saying. Um, yeah, there's sort of epistemic uh, viewpoints, which are, well, I'd say, sort of related to the Shuffman calculator. You know, yeah. Quantum mechanics is a way of, of, of codifying a knowledge of the world, of, of what we can know about, about um, the, the world. And then there are <coughs> sort, of, um, sort of ways of trying to reconcile um, classical determinism with uh, quantum prob um, probabilities by using uh, pilot waves or some underlying um, non-local field which uh, determines the behavior of quantum systems. <coughs> but we'll ignore these issues here and um, it's best saved for a discussion over a pint. Okay, so <coughs> let's, uh, so I mean there's sort of two extreme ways of trying to understand quantum theory and it's seeming disconnect with classical theory and how they're, how they're different. Uh, one is a um, very traditional view where you say, well, we look around ourselves and, and, and things look to be classical, we operate classically. Things have definite position. Um, you know, things um, don't spontaneously um, tunnel here and there. We don't see half-dead afterlife cat. So I accept that actually the, the you know maybe you want to accept that you know, the classical world is really you know the real the true state of affairs in this quantum theory is is some weird description that, that we need to interpret so that we can um, you know recover we, we can we can um, we should interpret actually as as a underlying classical theory but we just see we're just looking at it wrong. The other view is to accept quantum theory for what it is, and then the, the big mystery here is actually how does the classical world evolve? Right? We take the the the, the, you know, the wave function and the Schrodinger equation um, as the actual state of affairs, and then think about how does uh, you know, non half dead alive cats? You know, how, how do we get rid of those um, so we don't see it in, in everyday life? Um, so, for example, we said the decurrence program. Um, I try to use that as a mechanism to recover uh, the classical world. <clears throat> so, I mean, that, that's a very quick introduction to some of the, you know, where we're coming from in, in terms of uh, quantum foundations, what, what some of the key questions are. So, let's um, start on the first uh, topic. Uh, that I showed up, and that, that's um, sort of Bell's theorem. But we need to, we need to go back a few years to uh, EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, in 1935. So you know, these are, this is one of the 
key papers in foundations um, in trying to understand um, where the quantum mechanics really was a, was a coherent framework and then whether we could extend it to try to encapsulate some of the underlying uh, classical reality which Einstein thought was, was actually the real state of affairs. So he was, he was trying to argue not that quantum mechanics was wrong, because he couldn't, because quantum mechanics was very successful, even uh, in 1935, able to predict um, uh, you know, so many effects which classical physics wasn't able to, to predict. So he wasn't trying to say it's wrong, he's just saying that you know, it didn't capture everything. There was actually a, a, a higher level description, or maybe a lower level description, actually, which quantum mechanics was merely a, um, a, a statistical um, description of. It's sort of like the difference between um, you know, thinking of uh, my, the microphysics and, my, and uh, um, micro uh, mechanics compared to statistical physics um, in thermodynamics. So it's arguing that quantum mechanics was incomplete um, by saying that the probabilities that you get from a, from a measurement, quantum mechanical measurement, was revealing the true state, underlying state of affairs, and the, and the wave function was simply a statistical ensemble average over those underlying uh, state of affairs. And so the underlying state of affairs you know, is normally called hidden variable. Um, and, he, and he tried to use a particular Gedanken experiment, uh, thought experiment, which um, appeared to sidestep Heisenberg's on system principles. So let's just look at that um, experiment. So I think the key thing that Einstein was saying was that he wanted to, try, first of all, define what was an element of reality. What did it mean for something to be real, as apart from uh, the wave function which seemed to be rather nebulous and you know, didn't seem to correspond to any actual uh, physical, um, um, physical quantity that uh, we would traditionally view it in classical mechanics. So he says, if without in any way disturbing a system we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. So, let's just deconstruct this, this statement a bit. So, saying that, say you have a box, and that if you can, if you open the box and you always find what you expect to find, then even before opening the box, then whatever is in the box or what, what you thought was in the box. Right? Now classically, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's um, no, no, no that's, that's not a, a very profound statement, right? Because we sort of implicitly assume that things exist even if we don't observe it. So, um, but quantum mechanics tells us or, or, or implic implies that if we don't observe something, then um, it's, uh, the state of the system is not well defined. Uh, so this, this uh, thing about prediction of certainty is, is sort of a, a sufficient, he's saying it's a sufficient condition to ascribe um, reality to the thing that you're observing. Right, so he comes up with this particular setup. So this is um, the particular setup he, he comes up with. So he's playing with two observables, position and momentum. And because position and momentum don't commute, we know that um, a, a system, a quantum system, cannot have a simultaneously well-defined position and momentum. Right? So if you have a particle and you try to uh, f um, define its, its position, and if that position is very well defined, then its momentum is, is, is not very well defined, and vice versa. So he, so that's what quantum mechanics says: is that if you have a particle, um, if you know, if its position is well defined, then um, there's no reality to its to its 
um, momentum. Right? So he's saying this is wrong. He says that actually, if you have a, a, a particle, it has both a well-defined position and momentum. It's just that uh, wave function for it doesn't, doesn't capture the, the reality of that. It's just a, a sort of a statistical average over um, uh, yeah, what it could be, and it's, it just represents that ignorance of what the actual values were. So Einstein comes up with this particular example to try to show that's the case, that in fact um, you can simultaneously define or find out what the position and momentum of a pair of particles, right? So it's not actually, not even just trying to find out the position and momentum of a single particle, is that it's going to simultaneously define, try to find out the position and momentum of this particle and this particle, both of them at the same time. So <clears throat> he comes up with this case where he has a, a, a state of two particles. One particle goes to Alice, one particle goes to Bob, and it's in this very peculiar state, which is called the EPR state. And the EPR state is a superposition of particles being highly correlated in both position and momentum. Right. So uh, if this x coordinate is you know, some coordinate like this, and p is some coordinate also in the, um, uh, you know, in, in the in that plane, then we have that the position that Alice of Alice's particle is precisely correlated position of Bob's particle. But if you do a little bit of mathematics with Fourier transforms, then you find that, in fact, this state is also precisely well correlated in momentum. There's just a minor sign there. <coughs> so what does it mean? All right, so if you we, if we go through standard quantum theory, let's say Alice measures what her particle position is. So she gets some value x. But because they know the initial state was this, then Alice, based on her measurement of x, can predict with certainty what Bob would get if he were to measure his position. Right. So Einstein's argument is that Alice has made a measurement on her particle. And then because she can predict exactly what Bob would get if he were to measure position, then Bob's particle's position is an element of reality. It exists, right? Because Alice is all over here, right? Bob's all the way over here. And Einstein being Einstein doesn't believe in fast light influence. So whatever Alice does here, her measurement, should not affect Bob's particle. So Alice's measurement here and her inferring what Bob's position should be is simply revealing a pre-existing state of reality. Right. Now, Bob, on the other hand, let's say that he doesn't actually measure <coughs> position, right? He doesn't need to measure position because all he has to, all he has to do is later on ask Alice, oh, what, what did you get when you measured your position of your particle, right? Because he doesn't need to measure position because he knows that Alice can tell him exactly what, what he should have got if he measured position, right? So Bob, he decides he's going to measure momentum, right? He measures momentum and he gets a certain p or minus p. And, he, and from that, he can make the same argument and, and infer exactly what result Alice should have gotten if she were to make a measure of measurement of momentum. Right? So Bob can now also predict with certainty what the momentum Alice should have gotten if she were to measure momentum. So now they get together after they've, after they've made their um, respective measurements and then they can conclude um, that in fact Alice's particle had a position x because she measured it directly. She also had momentum p because Bob can tell her exactly what she should have got if she were to measure momentum and vice versa. So they both know simultaneously the position momentum of their particles. Now this seems to be in contradiction to quantum mechanics, which 
says, Heisenberg's insistence principle says that, you know, the, the momentum position of these particles, you know, they can't be simultaneously well-defined. Yet Einstein seems to have come up with a way of, of actually measuring the actual position and momentum of each particle. So this was this is uh, EPR's argument that quantum mechanics doesn't capture this, you know, this underlying reality that in fact the, the particles do have definite position and, and momentum. Hence, was incomplete. Right, so just to summarise, <coughs> um, so we, we have, we've had to use Einstein invokes locality, and that Alice's choice of measurement doesn't affect. Bob's result, and vice versa. But they also do use something called counterfactual reasoning. Right? So Alice concludes on the basis of her measurement what Bob should have gotten if he were to measure position. Right? And it's probably and it's probably true. You know, if 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 uh, if um, if Alice were to measure x, then if Bob were to measure position, he would have gotten x as well. But he doesn't actually measure it, right? So, uh, but she still concludes that the position of Bob's particle is x. And vice versa with, with, with momentum. So, uh, just to conclude, yeah, so EPR concludes that quantum mechanics is complete, incomplete. Um, because a complete physical theory should be able to describe the state in terms of definite outcomes uh, for any possible set of measurements. So, in this case, I started saying there should be there should be a theory which actually has that the the particles that Alice and Bob get do have definite position and momentum, not their superposition, but have actual definite position and momentum in any particular run. It's just that our ignorance of what those actual position and momentum um, are gives us the wave function description. So there was a lot of to and fro between Einstein and Bohr about this. Uh, not going to get into it, but basically, um, it took quite a long time for people to actually come up with anything concrete, and it took be it, 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 basically it took Bell to to try to tease out the essence of um, of you know, these arguments and, and come up with a um, anything. Concrete to test, or what? What were the what were the consequences of, of, of these assumptions um, that Einstein imposed upon his, you know, his idea of a complete physical theory? So, how do you test these classical assumptions? So, how do you test the fact that there is um, a real, you know, a, a sort of realism that there's an underlying state of affairs of you know actual positions, actual momentum, and also. Um, this other assumption which Einstein made was locality, right? That, um, that Alice's actions do not affect the results of Bob's uh, measurement. And so he came up with uh, you know, Bell's theorem or Bell's inequality. Um, and you take those two assumptions above and, and basically some other reasonable assumptions. Um, and then he came up with an actual concrete result. Uh, observable limits, limits to what you could actually observe or, or, or create uh, with these assumptions. Are uh, there any physical theory which, which obeyed these assumptions? Um, they, um, you could find limits to, to correlations that they would predict. And the key result is that quantum mechanics violates these assumptions. Hence, Einstein's idea about what quantum theory should be local and realistic could not be true. Now, originally Bell came up with a, um, his original statement of the theorem and, and, and uh, proposal for a test uh, wasn't particularly experimental amenable. So later on, other people have refined the idea, and the one that's most familiar and uh, most seems to be one that's easiest to, to do in the lab is, is the Clouser Hall and Chimney Holt, or CHSH inequality. So we'll just go through this um, as, as, as an example. So again, we have 
this sort of uh, EPR setup where we have a source of sending out two particles, one to Alice, one to Bob. And again, we have that Alice can measure two types, two properties, right? A1 or A2, and Bob can measure properties B1 or B2, just like position momentum. So nothing different. Now, if you consider um, the joint, the set of joint measurements, so if, if, if we consider um, Alice and Bob being able to, to choose, freely choose which measurements to do um, randomly, independently of each other, then we've got uh, four sets. So um, Alice could measure um, property one, Bob could measure property one as well for his side, etc., etc. So there are four different um, joint measurement settings. And um, the simplest case is if, if each measurement has two possible outcomes, right? So uh, Alice, for her measurements, A1 and A2, could get a, a result of plus one or a, or a result of minus one. Same for Bob, um, his results of B. And then we can, we can um, uh, write down the correlation function, which is basically, uh, let's say that Alice measures her property one and Bob measures her property, property two then we want to see whether their results, the plus or minus one results, are correlated or anti-correlated. And so uh, this uh, correlation function just tells us, are they going to be you know, predominantly the same direction, or are they going to be a different direction, or different, different results? And so uh, we have um, plus one times the probability of them both getting the same result, right? Or, um, and we average that with the probability of get it, them getting um, different results, minus one, plus one, or plus one, minus one, and we average that with, a, um, with, the, with the eigenvalue minus one, which is the product of plus one, minus one. And it's very simply the st simple to state the CHSH inequality in saying that if you have a local realistic theory, so a theory which basically obeys the, uh, what Einstein thinks a theory should, should be like, then if you combine these correlation functions for all four measurement, joint measurement settings in this particular way, um, there, there are different ways of combining them, but this is the, this is the standard way. Uh, you take um, the correlation where they both choose the first setting, when they have different settings, and then you take away the correlation when they, when they um, choose the second setting. And if you take the absolute value of that, we know that that is going to be less than or equal to 2. Right. So let's, before going through the formal proof, when I say proof, it's actually like three lines of algebra, but um, let's just think about what, what does this mean, right, in, in real terms, in, in sort of terms which um, classical, we would, how, how would we think it in, in terms of classical physics? So here, here's an example where um, it's Christmas, Christmas morning, and uh, Santa has uh, given presents to Alice and Bob. Um, and Alice and Bob, they, they live far away from each other. So, um, you yeah, know, we've got this, uh, we've got locality, so whatever Alice does should influence uh, what Bob gets, right? So these are, these are classical boxes, presents. And Santa has decided to play a trick in that um, he's actually put one sock in each box. Right? So it's a pair of, pair of socks. Uh, there's one sock in Alice's box, there's one sock in Bob's sock. Um, now these are, these are strange socks in that even, even though they have um, two properties of, uh, of interest, one is the size of the sock. So we have uh, little socks and big socks. But, um, so we've got, yeah, here, yeah, little, little sock and a big sock. But also, they also have colour. So in, in this case, we've got green or red socks because it's Christmas. Right. But they're, they're, they're sort of like quantum socks in, in the fact that we can, no, only simul we can never simultaneously measure both the colour and size of the socks. Right. So... Um, when Alice and Bob look into their boxes, right, they have to choose. Are, are they going to, for instance, say, feel inside and see whether it's a big sock or a, a small sock? 
Or do they sort of look at a little sample swatch and see what color the sock is? Right? So <coughs> this is like in quantum two, we can only measure, say, one, uh, one set of commuting observables. Right? We can't measure uh, incompatible observables. We can't measure non-commuting observables simultaneously. And again, um, to, to put it into the terms of the previous, um, in the CHSS, HS, no, CHSH inequality, will give some numerical values to, to um, yeah, so plus one for a small sock, minus one for a big sock, plus one for a green sock, minus one for a red sock. All right, so what does it, what does it mean in terms of um, the assumption that, that Einstein or Bell yeah, were, were making? So realism, right? So if we have just one sock, then the realist assumption is that our socks actually have a definite size and color, right? Even though we may only be able to measure one of those properties, underlying it all, it actually has the other property that we don't measure, right? So we can have a small red sock, we can have a big red sock, we can have a small green sock, a big green sock. Now, if we have two socks, two, you have, have a, you know, there's a pair of socks, one goes to Alice, one goes to Bob. Oh, all right, sorry, I should mention, all right. So, um, so these are different cases. These are different states of reality, right? These are the hidden variables. So whether we have lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda four. So lambda is the traditional uh, symbol for a hidden variable. Right? So when we measure our sock, say its size, then um, if you see a big sock, then we don't know whether we had lambda equals 2 or lambda equals 4, right? We just know we have a big sock. The underlying state of reality is still hidden. All right, so if you have two socks, we've got a proliferation of different um, underlying states of reality. So we could have uh, two small red socks, or we could have a big green sock and a small red sock, right? And obviously this grows all right, exponentially the number of, number of uh, different possibilities. But the key thing is that under a realist assumption is that if you're given these pair of socks into these two boxes, we only have one of these at a time, right? There's only one of these actual state of affairs in our boxes, right? We just don't know which one it is. Right, so what's the locality assumption? So the locality assumption is that the state of uh, the outcome of Alice's measurement does not depend on the choice of measurement by Bob. So if Bob decides to measure, say, the size of the sock, then his choice of measuring the size does not influence what Alice's sock is. Right? So if Alice originally had a, say, a big green sock, a uh, big red sock, sorry. Right, so, um, so she's got, say, one of these, right? Um, but let's say she has this one, right? So in a, in a particular instance, she actually has a big red sock, and Bob has a small green sock. If Bob decides to measure the color of his sock, then Alice's sock does not mysteriously change into something else. Right? So if Bob decides to choose color, then it doesn't, wasn't, doesn't magically change into, say, lambda equals two, a small red sock. Or it doesn't change into, um, into lambda equals four, a small <coughs> green sock. Right? So Bob's choice has no influence on Alice's actual sock. And Alice's sock is only predetermined by lambda, right? So in this case, lambda equals 10, right? not by what Bob decides to, to measure. And under these two assumptions, it's actually trivial. Bell's theorem is trivial, right? So <clears throat> let, we'll denote this uh, uh, CHSH quantity. Uh, by the symbol S, and let's just 
just for an instance, um, think of a single run of this experiment. So you wake up one morning, Alice and Bob, they see these boxes, uh, uh, you know, one in each of their living rooms. And the local realistic assumption is that there is actually only one particular instantiation of our pairs of socks. Right? So we let's so it's fixed. Lambda's fixed. Right? So this is one state of affairs. So there are definite values for A1, A2, B1, or B2. So whether Alice decides uh, to measure uh, colour on her sock, then her sock has a definite colour. Same, same as it has a definite size, same with Bob's colour and size of his sock. So if we look at S, this, uh, this expression, then we, we can take the averages out, we'll take the averages out, and actually just work out what the value of that particular lambda is, what the S value of that particular lambda is. So A1 and B1, they have definite values, so plus one or minus one. And the value of A does not depend on whether Bob measures um, property 1 or property 2. Right? So <clears throat> the value of A does not depend on, on what, uh, it's the same value of A1, right? Regardless of whether Bob chooses one um, size or color. That's the locality assumption. So we can factorize this expression into this, right? Simple algebra. And now it's a very simple way of just going through the maths and, and concluding that either Bob's color and size have the same value, plus one or minus one, right? So if these things are both the same, so if it's plus one and plus one, or minus minus one, then this has modulus two, right? And this is modulus one, so this thing has modulus two. But if these two are the same, when you take two things, the same things from away from each other, this becomes zero, right? Or, conversely, if B1 and B2 are different, so one's plus one, one's minus one, or the other way around, right? This disappears, and this is modulus two. Right? So, just by considering whether the properties B1 and B2 have values plus one or minus one, whether they're the same, they're both plus one and minus one, or they're different, plus one and minus one, then only one of these two brackets can ever be non-zero. Right. Right. If, if, uh, if, um, if, if that's still unclear, just go through the, the different cases. Right. There are four different cases for B1, B2, and just go through it and you'll see that, in fact, we get two as the value of S for any particular configuration of large, small, red, or, or green socks. Now, now we can look, go backwards and say, all right, let's just look at the ensemble average. Uh, if you have a mixture, if you allow any particular probability distribution of a lambda, then we have a convex sum. Therefore, we cannot increase the value, right? This is an extremal value. Of S. And Bell's theorem or the CHSH inequality just falls out trivially in three lines of algebra. Right? So technically it is trivial, but conceptually it took nearly 30 years to Bell to, uh, for Bell to translate um, the arguments of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen into something which had an actual experimental consequence. So let's let's think of, of so, so to, just a remark. Bell's theorem actually has nothing much to say about quantum mechanics, right? Because quantum theory doesn't obey those assumptions, right? Mathematically, it doesn't. So the, the 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 key thing is, if you were to do an experiment, what would you find? Could you find a violation of that S value. Could you actually do the experiment, find a correlation of, uh, such that when you calculated S, you, you got greater than two? 
And if you do the calculation for the quantum mechanics, you find yes, you do. And people have done the experiments and, the, and, and they find that when they do the experiment, they calculate s to be greater than 2 and greater than 2 by an amount that, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not due to random, random fluctuations of your experimental results. So what, what, what's a typical experiment for, for a Bell test? Um, so the ones which are sort of simplest to do are uh, using a what's called um, an entangled photon source. So you have a source which takes a single photon, uh, say typically say a blue photon, 400 nanometers, and you pass it through a crystal. And this crystal is a, a nonlinear crystal. Uh, and because of the nonlinearity of the of the of the, crystal, of the response of the crystal to electric fields of the, of the incoming photon, um, it produces, uh, it takes that single blue photon and changes it into two red photons, or infrared photons, near infrared photons. And because um, you have conservation of energy and conservation of momentum, uh, the two photons, um, they have the same form as our original EPR state, right? Correlated momentum and correlated in, in position. Uh, moreover, you can set it up so that they're actually correlated in polarization. Right. So you, you get a you get a um, a, 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 a Bell singlet or, or, a, or a Bell a maximally entangled state of, of polarization, where you're now your two observables now that Alice and Bob can do are simply the components of polarization along different axes. So what we have here is that Alice can either measure in, say, a, a horizontal vertical basis, or she can decide to measure in the plus or minus 45 degree basis. And Bell, uh, sorry, Bob, can measure either in um, a polarization uh, directions which are sort of 22 and a half degrees um, um, different from, from um, Alice's. And when people actually do the experiment, they find that they achieve an S value which is very, very close to 2 root 2, which is the maximum that quantum mechanics allows. So this is 2.8 something compared to 2. And 2.8 something is very different from 2, right? You, you can't mistake 2.8. Uh, from two. Um, I'm not going to go into the actual technical details. Uh, different experiments have tried to uh, be as ideal as possible, to, to try to um, be as faithful to the underlying assumptions of, of uh, Bell's theorem. Um, the original, the original uh, I guess, celebrated experiment by Alain Asper um, tried to close what's called the lo locality loophole, right? So we got these two photons, they're being sent in different directions, and Alice must choose to do A1 and A2, Bob must choose to do B1 and B2, but the locality uh, assumption is that Alice must make a choice, right? Faster than the time of uh, than the uh, time of flight time that light takes to get from Alice's position to Bob's position and Bob gets his result, right? So we don't want Alice's choice to influence Bob's measurement result. Now, light travels very quickly, so uh, we have to do that very quickly. So um, it's been challenging, but people have been, do, been able to do it. Uh, but there are other different assumptions that, that are implicit in, in Bell experiments. These are just a few of them. Uh, so in the ideal Bell experiment, Every time a, a pair of presents are given to Alice and Bob, Alice and Bob measure their, their socks and they get a result. Right? Now, in real quantum optics experiments, when you're sending these photons, um, for instance, the detectors, they're not very efficient. So sometimes, well, most of the time, you know, the photons get sent out in pairs, but for some reason, this detector doesn't detect the photon. Well, this one doesn't detect the photon, right? 
So most of the time, they'd actually miss all these photons which are being sent out. They only get a subset of the actual photons which are actually uh, sent out. Now, a reasonable assumption, one may say, is that, well, this is just random, and it's just totally random which pairs of photons actually get measured. But if, if you are a bit paranoid, you would say, actually, maybe those 